Welcome to lecture 11. We're going to continue today with the discussion that we started last lecture regarding decay, decay processes, decay paths. You see a few of those illustrated here. Uh, these are the ones that we've covered so far that we went into detail at least. Uh, alpha decay, where we lose a uh, helium nucleus as the light product of that decay process. Uh, we have beta decay, what's labeled here is beta decay. Uh, this is what we termed a beta minus decay. Uh, we had gamma decay and then we had positron emission, which is the same thing as beta plus decay. And then we had electron capture. And just as a reminder, the daughter products here and here are exactly the same. So electron capture and, and beta plus, which is also positron emission, those typically compete with each other. Same parent, same daughter. Uh, but today's lecture is going to focus on how do we determine the likelihood of these decay processes, processes happening. So we know that uranium-238 is going to be almost 100% alpha decay, but how often does that happen? How long is it going to take? And that sort of thing. Um, so we'll discuss these, these concepts uh, such as decay constant half-life. Those are two uh, parameters that we would typically use in characterizing the inventory, how many, how many uh, atoms of a different, different material we have there of the, of the parent versus the daughter. And we will uh, attempt to create expressions to uh, quantify those, that inventory as a function of time. And so that's what this, uh, this note down here is, is discussing. We, we haven't really talked about how often a decay event is going to take place. We, have, we know of these different types of, of decay, and, and for a particular radioisotope, we know what, what types of decay are going to occur. We, just, we haven't talked about how often they occur. And the primary metric that, that we're going to use to characterize this is the half-life, uh, and that's going to be related to another metric called the decay constant, which we're going to use more often in in describing the inventory with with uh, with expressions as a function of time. Uh, but we'll first talk about half life because because it's a little simpler to to understand. My t my half life is just the time that it takes the population to decay to half the original. So in this time frame, half of the uh, nuclei that were the parent have now become the daughter. They've decayed to the daughter. So this is the time it takes a large population to uh, decay to half the original number. So if I know how many molecules or how many uh, atoms of a of the parent I have in a, in a sample, if I wait for a time interval of, that's equal to that, that half, the uh, half-life, then I will be left with half as many of those uh, parent nuclei, and I'll have, I started with zero of the daughter products, and I've built that up to now half the population is the daughter product. And if I wait another half-life, then I've taken what's left over, and, and that's decreased by half in the parent and increased by that same amount in the daughter. And, and there's, no, there's no way of predicting with any accuracy at all a, a given nucleus and, and when, at what time it's going to decay. And so don't, don't confuse half-life with the time it takes for a nucleus to decay. This is a large population metric that it's characterizing. Um, we just know that of the nuclei that are available in that population, half of them, we don't know which half, we couldn't identify which ones are going to fall into that category having decayed and which ones are going to fall into the category of, of, of not having the decay happen yet. And so this is, this is a population statistic or, or character, characterization. So if we look at this plot here, this is uh, the number of undecayed nuclei. So we start out with some population value. We have the number of nuclei that, that could go under decay, and, and this x-axis is time, but it's expressed in units of, of half-life. 
And so as we go to the first half-life, we see that that sample has dropped to a value of half of what it was. And we go to another half-life, and we see it's decreased by another factor of two, and so on and so forth. And so this is called the decay curve, this uh, function here. So this is n of t. And we want to know, when we say we're going to develop an expression for the inventory, that's what we mean. We want to find an expression for that n as a function of time. We know it starts out at, at n naught, and it's going to decay uh, to lower and lower values as time goes on. And it's important to recognize that these atoms, it's not that they disappear. They, they just become the daughter products. And so if I was to plot the inventory of the daughter as a function of time, it would start at zero. Presumably all the, the nuclei that we have at the beginning at time equals zero is all the parent. Then I would slowly be building this one up. As this one is dropping, this one is building up. So we talk about a metric called activity. Um, activity is this here. This is the number of decay events that are happening per second. So it's the rate that the decay events are occurring. Decays per second, or sometimes you'll see disintegrations per second. That can be a little bit more confusing to think about it that way, just because the word disintegration uh, has this connotation of, of somewhat disappearing, but it's, that's not simply not the case. We're, we've decayed into a daughter product and released a, an alpha particle or a beta plus or beta minus or, or whatever the, the, um, the decay path happened to be. And this here decays per second. This is totally equivalent to disintegrations per second. Either one of those in the fundamental units are going to be represented by BQ, which is Becquerel, named after the, the uh, scientist that discovered it. And so when we say disintegrations per second or decays per second, uh, decay events per second, um, we can just simply replace that with uh, the unit of Becquerel. So that is the activity and there should be an n in here so this is proportional to n of t and the as a reminder this n here represents the number of atoms available at a given moment in time that could potentially undergo this decay event So this n of t, just like we've shown up here with the decay curve, it's decreasing with time. And statistically, the relationship between those two is going to be that the activity, meaning the number of, the rate at which things are decaying, is going to be proportional to that, but the, the proportionality constant, we're going to call this lambda, where lambda is what's called the decay constant. And this is going to have units in order to uh, be consistent, it'll be have units of one over time. So for example, one over seconds. And this is similar conceptually to the cross section, when we, especially when we talk about the macroscopic cross section. If you recall the macroscopic cross section, had units of one over length, one over meter. But what it really did is tie us into the probability that such and such an event was going to happen, whether it's a scattering reaction or a fission or, or whatever the cross-section represented. Uh, but we had the, the targets, we had the number of nuclei in there, and in, in this case it was the density, but but we had, we had a number of, of nuclei in there and then we had the number of reactions that we wanted to get at the end of that expression. And so it was the cross-section that converted the number of, of possible reactions to the number of actual reactions. 
And that's, conceptually, that's exactly what we're talking about here. This, this lambda, this decay constant, uh, is, relates the, the rate of radiation, so the, the actual decay process is the rate of that, um, divided by the amount of material there, so the, of the, the potential there. And so this represents the uh, rate of decay, of, of decay, or we'll call it this radiation. divided by the amount of material. And so every isotope has its own unique value of half-life. Uh, it also has its own unique value of this decay constant. And so this, this, uh, this Becquerel, as we said before, this is the fundamental unit. This is going to be decays per second or disintegrations per second. That's what this is referring to. And those two are uh, exactly equivalent. There's no difference in calling it disintegrations per second, decays per second, or uh, Becquerel. Uh, but this number is typically a, a very large number, and so a more convenient unit here is the Curie. And one Curie is going to be 3.7 times 10 to the tenth Becquerel. And you'll also see this in millicurie or microcurie or or so on and so forth. Um, but it, it's just a a way to um, tie it back to numbers that aren't so large in magnitude. And so if we think about this activity, this these decays per second, then we could express this as over some time interval, the change in my number in my inventory, so how many nuclei I have of that uh, radioisotope and if I look at over some time window how that had changed then that's gonna that's gonna go down that that's gonna be a negative number and so that's why this negative is out there in front of that to make that a positive number again um, that represents the activity if I lose this many samples over a time window and that and I know the time window is 10 seconds and I and I can just say well that's if I lost that many of my inventory to decay then that is the activity and so this I could also express as in the limit as t goes to infinity as just ddt of that inventory so dn dt is ultimately tied back to the activity, which is what we're characterizing here, which we know is just equal to lambda times that n. And so I've got this differential equation here that I can easily solve. Um, I've got dn dt equals minus lambda n. So I can separate and integrate. got dn over n equals minus lambda times dt and I will just integrate both sides and this gives me the natural log of n and I'm going to go from some initial inventory n naught to n and this is going in time 0 to t so the natural log of n evaluated from n naught to n equals minus lambda times t, which is evaluated from t to 0, is just going to be t. And so I'm left with the n of t equals, I'll take the exponential of both sides. And so we look back at this, this equation up here, and this, this now we have an expression for. This is just going to be n naught, the, the, the initial inventory times the exponential of minus lambda t. So if we know lambda, then we can characterize the inventory and how it changes with time. And if we want to look at activity, um, just recall that this is just lambda times nt, so this will be equal to 
and not times lambda times the exponential. And so not only do we have the inventory as a function of time, we also know the uh, activity as a function of time, and this is generally called the initial uh, activity. So a naught is equal to lambda times m naught n naught. And so we could we could just say a t equals a naught times that same exponential relationship. So the question is, we got this lambda, we got the decay constant, we talked initially about the half-life, that t, t half, and the, the question, well, how do these relate? Well, the time constant is the time such that my inventory decreased by a factor of two. So what does that look like? Time such that n of t over n naught equals one half. And so I'm left with the exponential of negative lambda times t, which we're assuming is t, the half length or the half half life. That's going to equal 0 0.5. Take the natural log of both sides, and I've got natural log of 0 0.5 equals minus lambda t half. Natural log of 0.5 is the same thing as saying the nat negative natural log of 2. So we can cancel those negative signs out. And we're left with my half-life is related to my decay constant, uh, is inversely related to my decay constant and multiplied by a factor of a natural log of two. And I could do the same thing with decay constant. Natural log of two divided by my half-life. So that's how I go back and forth from one to the other. And uh, it's going to be easiest to use the exponential form of the expression for inventory just because uh, we're going to end up taking, we're going to actually solve, we're going to end up solving systems of differential equations. Um, and it's just much easier to use exponential in that case. But uh, I find it useful to think about this also in terms of the half life. So t over t one half. So in other words, if I go one half life, then it's half the original inventory. If I go two half lifes, then it's one fourth the original inventory, which would be one half raised to the second raised to the second power, and so on and so forth. Okay, and then the last uh, before we go to a few examples, the last thing we'll talk about is is this decay power release. And so every event that we have we're going to release some amount of energy and if we know the rate at which the decays are happening then then we know the power the energy per time and so we're going to look to something that we've that we've gone over many times throughout the lectures and that's the q value the q value represents that energy release for one event so look to q value so my power as a function of time is just going to be that Q value times the activity. The activity is the decays per second. Therefore, this is going to be 1 over time. And then my Q value is going to be energy. So I got energy over time. That's power. And so I could just call this Q times A naught times the exponential of negative lambda t. And so things are changing with time. I have my inventory exponentially decre decreasing with time in an exponential fashion. Uh, my activity is also decreasing as a function of time. My highest activity is going to be the initial activity and, and the number of disintegrations, the number of decays per second is dropping with time as well in an exponential fashion. And therefore the power, the power that I could produce with these decays um, is also decreasing with time. And so this is important when, when trying to predict what kind of uh, nuclear battery you need uh, in space applications, for example. If we, we know that we need this much electric power and we're using this sort of conversion, uh, now we know how much thermal power we need. Um, we need to recognize that if we design for the initial uh, activity to get that thermal power, then in one half-life and two half-lifes it's going to be one half of that and one fourth of that. 
So let's go do a couple examples. In example one, we want to consider the alpha decay of plutonium-238. Uh, we're going to also need to determine the initial activity of one gram of that radioisotope, and we want to find out what the initial power output from this decay process is. So we've got plutonium-238 is going to decay. Um, and alpha is going to decrease this by two, so that's going to become uranium. And it's going to become uranium-234 plus my alpha particle. So that's the reaction. Um, I can go find the Q value to this and find that it's 5.593 MeV. And you are familiar, hopefully at this point, with a number of resources where you could find that value. Um, and hopefully you have some functions built in your own uh, programs that, that could calculate that for us as well. So we want to find the activity. Um, the activity, we want to find the initial activity, so that's A0. So A0 is going to be lambda times N0. So we're going to use half-life data. We need to find out what the half-life to plutonium-238 is. And once we find out that, we can find out what lambda is by, by using the natural log of 2 divided by that half-life to get lambda. So let's go and look up in this, the Korean resources here. So we go plutonium 238, and I got my atomic mass there. You can see this is going to be an alpha decay, and my half life here is 87.7 years. So as I come back and, and try to characterize that, then use T half equals 87.7 years. To find lambda. And eventually we want that lambda to be in units of, of one over a second. And so we find out that lambda is going to equal the natural log of two divided by the half-life. And that's going to be equal to uh, natural log of two divided by 87.7 years. One year going to be 365.25 days, one day, 24 hours, uh, one hour is 3,600 seconds. So my units are all canceling out to be one over second. When I do that calculation, I get that lambda is 2.505 times 10 to the negative tenth units of one over second. So now we want to use the, we got to find out the initial inventory. We got to find that n naught. We've got a value for lambda. Um, we know that the mass here, we got one gram of plutonium-238. So we're going to use that to find n naught. So n naught is going to equal Avogadro's number times that mass divided by the molar mass which is also equal to my mass in, in AMU. AMU per, uh, per atom is the same thing as uh, grams per mole. And so I've got 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd times my mass, which is one gram, divided by my molar mass, which I can look up in the functions I have, or I can go back here and see that it's 238 0.0496 and this is an AMU but it's also the same thing in grams per mole and so moles cancel out, grams cancel out and I'm just left with the number and so this ends up equaling 2.53 times 10 to the 21 so that's how many nuclei I have. That's how many atoms of plutonium-238. Assuming that 
100%, initially 100% of that one gram of my sample is plutonium-238. And this, the same, the same analysis would hold true if I have some other sample and of that sample I have a gram of plutonium-238. Everything that we're doing here is going to be identically, uh, uh, exactly equal to that. So I've got my number of, I've got my inventory at the, at the beginning. I've got lambda, therefore a naught is just lambda times m naught, n naught, 2.505 times 10 to the negative tenth per second multiplied by 2.53 times 10 to the 21. And I get 6.336. times 10 to the 11th. That's going to be units of one per second, but it's, it represents decays per second, and so that's going to be 6.336 e to the 11th uh, Becquerel. And if you do the conversion factor there, this would be 17.1 Curie. So now we found the initial activity. Now we need to find the initial power output of this decay process and that is just going to be my activity times the Q value. And so this will be 6.336 times 10 to the 11th Becquerel, one per second, decays per second, multiplied by 5.593 MeV. And we need to convert that to joules so in order to get a joule per second. And the conversion there is going to be 1.60218 times 10 to the minus 13 joules for every MeV. And so I'm left with units of joules per second. And joules per second is watts. And so I multiply this out and I get my initial power to be 0 0.568. And this is for one gram, so that means it, it means that's the initial power, first of all, and, and that, that number is going to decrease exponentially as a function of time. Uh, but it's also, since, since our mass was one gram, then this, this could also be expressed as the specific power. A specific quantity is one that is divided by its mass. And so in some of the homework problems, you'll be asked to find the specific activity or the specific power. And all that means is the activity per gram of the substance, per mass of the substance, or power per mass. Since sample was one gram, these also represent specific activity. and specific power. Okay, let's go on to example two. In this case we've got 10 milligram sample of some material. We're not given the material here. Uh, but we know that it has an initial specific activity equal to 3 millicurie per gram. We know that its half-life is 38 hours. So we know the half-life, and uh, we know the mass, and we know the specific activity. So this is going to be a naught divided by mass. And we want to know how many nuclei remain after three days. So we, we have 38 hours, which is 24 hours and some change, almost, almost a day and a half, a little over a day and a half. Um, and so a day and a half to three days, this is going to be approximately um, two time or two lengths of, of half-life. And so we expect it to go down by four or somewhere around those, those uh, numbers. Okay, so part A, let's figure out the, uh, the number of nuclei there. We've got to first take a look at this activity. And we're going to take this millicurie. per gram is what that number means and we want to multiply that by the mass 
which is going to be 0 0.01 grams. That's my mass. And then let's convert from Curie back to uh, Becquerel. Um, and that's, so that's going to be 3.7 times 10 to the 10th Becquerel for one Curie. And so my initial activity in units of Becquerel is going to be 1.11 times 10 to the 6th. Let's look at the half-life. We've got a half-life of three or uh, 38 hours. We want to find, we're gonna, we know we're going to need to find the decay constant. And so this will be over 38 hours. One hour has 3,600 seconds. And so our decay constant we're going to find to be 5.067 times 10 to the negative sixth one per second. So that's our activity, that's our decay constant, and we know that the initial inventory is just going to be equal to that initial activity divided by that decay constant. So Becquerel is one per second and lambda is also one per second. And we find out the initial inventory is going to be 2.19 times 10 to the 11th. So that's the number of atoms, that's the number of nuclei that I have initially before uh, the decay processes have commenced. And I know that my function now, my, my decay rate or my decay function is just going to be equal to that initial inventory times exponential of the decay constant times the time. And I just need to evaluate that at time equals three days. And if I convert that to seconds, that's going to be 2.592 times 10 to the fifth seconds. So just substitute that into my expression and I find that T of, when I substitute three days, that's going to be equal to uh, 5.89 times 10 to the 10th. And we said it's going to be roughly a factor of four and that's what we, that's what we see. We initially had 2e to the 11th and we're left with 5e to the 10th. And so that, that's, that, that's roughly a factor of four decrease in, in the number of, of, of atoms available. So my inventory has decreased by a factor of, of four or close to it. So that is my answer for part A. For part B, we, we now want to find the total number of radioactive decays in this three-day interval. And so if I think about how much of my inventory I've lost, that is exactly the same number as the, the atoms that have gone through decay. So the number of decays is equal to whatever I lost from my inventory. So initially I had n naught, and I just subtract those two and I get that my number of decays then is going to be equal to 1.60 times 10 to the 11th. That's how many decays I've had with this, uh, with this isotope, which was unnamed, but we know the half-life, we know the mass, we know the initial specific activity. Okay, let's go back to our lecture here. And if we think about now a simple decay process that results in a daughter, which is stable, then if we want to characterize these in, in an equation form, then we want to look at the inventory not just of the parent, but we want to look at the inventory of the daughter. And if this is just a single decay process, so I have some radioactive isotope 
and it only goes through one decay and it now reaches some daughter which happens to be stable. That's what we're talking about here. And so I would have X my parent become a daughter plus some light whatever type of uh, uh, particles are there due to the decay uh, and I want to know the inventory I have the inventory for the parent that's what I've developed so far but I also want to find the the, the inventory for the isotope for the uh, stable daughter so what does that look like? Well, I know that n of my parent as a function of time is just going to be whatever the initial number of atoms I had of that parent, and that will be decreasing with time according to the decay constant. So that's my, that's my expression for the parent. And the expression for the daughter in this case is just going to be whatever that original one was minus how many I have available at the time. So my, my change in that inventory is just going to be equal to this. Minus n0 x times exponential minus lambda t. And so ny of t my daughter inventory is just going to be, I just need to know what my parent inventory was at the beginning, and this is related according to the following expression. So now I've got an expression for not just the parent, but for the daughter. And we will eventually develop a more robust way of looking at this um, for an entire decay chain. Um, so let's look at a, a couple of those here in, uh, we'll go to Janus for this, and let's look at the radioactive data. Let's go here, and let's look at the decay. So if you remember from last lecture, we, we focused on uranium. I think it was 238, or maybe it was 235. Either way, we can open this up and we can look at the decay data there. Here's the general decay data. Um, here's my half-life for four, almost four and a half billion years. That's the half-life of U-238. Um, it goes through alpha decay to thorium-234. Uh, but over here, there also is the decay path. And this was um, This was it for uranium, uranium-238. And so I have, I have an alpha decay, and I go through all these sub-processes until I eventually reach lead-206, and that's a stable, the stable product of this. And so this, this decay path is available for any isotope that you want to look through. And so as we go and look at something that might be a little more complicated, um, we have a parent that now has two possible decay paths. And so you, we saw that with some of the daughter products in the, in the decay chart or the decay chain of, of uranium-238. Um, now, for, for many of those, it was extremely unlikely to, to go this other path. And so we, in the example we did last lecture, we just focused on the dominant path. But, but there are examples when a parent could have a non-negligible chance of going in, in at least one or two, in, in two or more uh, different decay paths. Uh, this could also represent the scenario where we have um, a compound nucleus, for instance, and we have different exit channels. Um, and so we would, we, we would look at the likelihood of each of those happening. But at any rate, we have our parent here, capital X, and that's going to have a couple of decay paths. So it could become Y1, which for the, for the moment we'll assume this is stable. Next lecture we'll look at scenarios where those aren't stable. We can look at longer chains. Um, but in order to consider this, we've got to look at the activity. 
and the activity of each decay path. So my total activity, the total of number of decays per second that I will see is whatever that first path is. If I'm decaying at a certain rate to daughter product number one, and I know how much I'm decaying, the rate at which I'm decaying to daughter product number two. I can simply just add those together. That equals the total number of disintegrations per second, the total number of decays per second that I would have in this, in this sample. That's what I would be measuring with some detector. And so in general, if I have even more than two, I could just sum these up. And it's a simple addition of all the different activities that I could have through all the different paths. Uh, but we're also interested in characterizing the, the population, so the inventory of each, the inventory of the parent and the inventory of daughter one, the inventory of daughter two. And so as I look at this expression for activity, then I could just say the following. I have activity for daughter number one due to daughter number one is just going to be lambda one times n of t where n of t in this case represents the number of the parent, that's the inventory of the parent. Uh, we'll get in a minute, we want an expression for n1 of t, the daughter of, or the, the inventory of daughter number one, and n2 of t, the inventory of daughter number two. Uh, but right now we can just call this lambda one times n plus lambda two times n. So you can see how all I need to do is just add those two decay constants together and we'll call this we'll call this the composite decay constant and regardless if I have two or three or four I just I take the lambda I take the uh, decay constant for each one of those paths and I and I, uh, I just add them all together. And that's my composite decay constant. And so what does my, what does my inventory of, of uh, daughter number one look like? And in order to find this, I just need to understand that if I know the activity due to daughter number one, then that's in units of decays per second, then I know that I just where are they decaying to? They are decaying to daughter number one. And so if, the, if I know the decays per second happening, that's the rate at which I'm increasing the inventory of daughter one. And likewise for N2, I could say the same thing for the activity two. So in order to know the inventory, I just need to integrate that activity function over some time interval. And so I'm gonna integrate activity of one dt and I'll put in the expression for activity of one, which was lambda one times n of t times dt. And, and now I need to put in the expression for n of t. Now this n of t, just as a reminder, is the number of parent. That's my inventory of my parent nucleus. Um, and so that's gonna be related to the composite the composite decay constant. So I'll integrate this, I got lambda one, and then n of t is just going to be equal to the initial number of my parent nuclei times the exponential of negative lambda t, where again, this is my composite decay constant. and not times zero to t of the exponential of minus lambda t. This is then going to equal lambda one and not times, it's got a negative out there in front now as I integrate that. And then I evaluate it at the bounds And that becomes exponential of negative lambda t minus the exponential of zero, which is one. 
And so my inventory for the daughter number one is going to be related. I got, I'm going to reverse the sign of these here to get rid of the negative. So I've got lambda one. Lambda one is the decay constant for my, the parent going to daughter number one. Lambda is the composite decay constant that, in, that is basically the sum of lambda one and lambda two. And then I've got my n naught, which is the initial inventory of the parent times one minus the exponential of minus lambda t. And we could do the same thing for n2, the, um, the inventory of daughter number two. Um, not surprising that this will just equal lambda two times that initial inventory of the parent. And so you can see that this ratio here, lambda two over lambda and lambda one over lambda, that is the relative probability that I'm going to go down any one of these paths. And so for instance, if I have a decay, decay constant that is really small, that means I have a very long half-life, which means it's not as likely for me to go down that path compared to the other one, which might have a very large decay constant, which means I, really ha I have a really short half-life. And so most of my disintegrations per second, most of the activity is going to be due to that lambda that is very large compared to the activity due to that lambda that's <coughs> very small. So let's go to a final example here. In example 11.3, we have cobalt 60, and that's going to uh, decay down to, uh, through a beta decay down to nickel 60. In fact, let's go back here to Janus. And let's go to cobalt. Cobalt 60. And we can see the general information for cobalt 60. I've got half-life of 5.27 years. Um, it's going to be a beta minus decay to nickel 60. And so we want to plot, in this case, we want to plot the inventory of cobalt-60 and versus time, and on the same plot, how the inventory of nickel-60. And if we look at the decay path here, then we see that, yes, nickel-60 is a stable daughter. And so there's just this one decay path from parent to daughter, and then we're done. So let's Let's, we're going to need to do this for, uh, plot this for up to 50 years. And so if we recall the, the time constant or the, uh, the decay constant, we need to figure out what the decay constant is. We need to do that with knowledge of the uh, half-life. And we're given a half-life of 5.271 years. Um, let's write down a few things here. My molar mass of uh, cobalt 60 is going to be equal to 59.934 grams per mole. Uh, and then I looked up my half-life. I read that off of the chart. This was 5.271 years, which equals 1.663 times 10 to the 8th seconds. Um, and then I can figure out my decay constant from that. I know this is natural log of 2 over the half-life. And this equals 4.167 times 10 to the negative ninth seconds, or 1 over seconds. There's my decay constant. And I know that my initial inventory for cobalt, we are given the mass here is 0.1 gram. So this will be Avogadro's number times the mass divided by the molar mass of cobalt, cobalt 60 in this case, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd per mole. 
and my mass is going to be 0 0.1 grams and then I've got 59.934 grams per mole. So my initial inventory of cobalt 60 is going to be equal to 1.005 times 10 to the 21 atoms. That's how many uh, nuclei I have of this that have the potential of undergoing this decay. And so my inventory for, for cobalt 60 as a function of time will just be equal to that initial inventory multiplied by the exponential of lambda t. And I've got all these uh, known at this point. I've, I've got them characterized. And I know that the inventory in this case of the nickel as a function of time is just going to be equal to uh, that initial inventory of cobalt times one uh, well, let's do it this way. Minus whatever that was for an, in any given moment of time, whatever my inventory is for cobalt. Any difference between those two is the same as the buildup of my inventory for that daughter product. And so I know this is well, I know what it's going to look like. I know that my inventory for cobalt is going to start up here and it's going to exponentially decrease and then my inventory for nickel is going to start at zero and then exponentially increase. If we go until time equals infinity then eventually all of this is going to become nickel. Um, in this case we're only going to 50 years but, but we'll see how that that looks like in just a minute. So this here was the initial inventory for cobalt at that number there and so initially I have no nickel and nothing but cobalt and as time goes on as time goes on all the way to infinity I have no cobalt and nothing but nickel so I can take these functions and I can plot them uh, we'll do this in uh, MATLAB so here's example number three uh, I know the mass I've been given the half-life here and I'm going to convert that from years to seconds. Uh, I can, can calculate my, my decay constant with knowledge of the half-life. I've got Avogadro's number here. I've got these functions that can look up AMU, and so I just specify for cobalt, I've got 27 protons. I've got 60 nucleons for cobalt 60. Um, I need to get the mass there. That's my mass of the, this is the in AMU, but it's the same as when units of grams per mole initial number of these cobalt 60 atoms then can be calculated with the same function that I that we went over uh, with our hand notes and now I just want to create a time vector and I'm going to go from 0 up to 50 because I need to go to 50 years and because this decay constant is is in units of 1 per second then I, I need to convert that from years to seconds and I'm going to convert it back because I want a plot that has plot of data for for year instead of uh, seconds um, allocate some space for some vectors and I'm just going to step through this in time and evaluate my first function just like we had written down in the notes and the second one is just going to be uh, the difference between the initial inventory of cobalt and whatever the co inventory happens to be at that moment in time for cobalt. That difference is the buildup, how many atoms now I have of nickel 60. And then just plot the results. Here's where I'm taking time in years and uh, converting it back from seconds to years. And that's what I want to plot. I've got two plots here. One that's the inventory of cobalt, the other the inventory of nickel. And we can see the plot here just like we had sketched out. And so as I go to, let's see, the, the time constant was roughly, uh, it's five and, and uh, five and some change, right? 5.25. So at roughly five years, I've gone from one e to the uh, one e to the tenth. No, let's see, what was it? My inventory here was one e to the twenty-one. 
And so this is 10 e to the 20th. So yeah, uh, this is my initial inventory and I decrease to half of that by about five years. And I decrease another half of that down to, from five down to 2.5 is about here. And that's, that's 10 years and some change. And then so on and so forth. So this is, this is behaving just like I had sketched out, just like I expected to. I start high, decay down to close to zero, start at zero, decay up to whatever the initial inventory was. And if I look at it after 50 years, let's, let's see what that was, or see what that is. So I've got N of the nickel, So I'm up to an inventory of 1e e to the 21th of the nickel, 21st of the nickel. The inventory of the cobalt by the time I go to 50 years, I'm down to 1.4e e to the 18th. And so it's, you know, my, my initial one was 1. Uh, I guess I got it right here, 1.0048 e to the 21 and so I'm not quite there but I've, I've gotten awfully close to it. Okay well that concludes this lecture. The next lecture we'll get into a little bit more complicated decay chains. We'll consider a more of a generalized approach to this and we're going to be able to set up some some differential equations that that have sources and sinks in them meaning I've got my parent that is decayed to this daughter but then that daughter decays to another daughter and so the if I look at the inventory of the daughter if I'm sitting in that that pool so to speak I've got a source coming from the decay process of the parent but then I have a sink that is giving it to the next daughter whatever that decay process happens to be and so depending on whether one of those has a large half-life compared to the other then I can I can predict this uh, in very simple terms uh, we'll do it in generic terms and then look at different scenarios where it can be simplified. All right, well, that concludes this lecture. Thank you.